Okay, hi, I'm Rachel, and I'll be telling you a little bit about Asaba pigs and their role in research. And I first came in contact with these pigs over the summer where I worked at a facility where they're specifically bred for the role of research. Um, they're on an island, uh, it's called Asaba Island, named after them, off the coast of Georgia in the USA. Um, this island has a lot of difficult conditions. It's very hot, it's humid, and the resources can be scarce. Um, they were introduced to the island first during the 1500s by European explorers, and they were thought to be brought from Spain, but the mitochondrial DNA is saying something else. It's saying that they were probably, they're more similar to pigs from the Canary Islands, uh, which shows the influence of Asian pigs. Um, however, it's hard to know exactly where they started out and came from because that only shows the maternal side since the mitochondrial DNA is only passed down to the mom side, um, so the male genetic past is still kind of vague. Um, the characteristics are that they have really thick, bristly hair. They have large teeth that have to be continuously trimmed. Um, I have a little bag of them that I was able to take home. Um, if you guys want to pass those, you can see what are those are the result of trimming off? Mm -hmm. are you, do you have to trim? I know you have to trim the tusks. Is it other teeth as well? I think it's just the ones that grow. What we would like call the tusks. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and they have different coat colors. Um, a lot of them are black. Some have black and white spots. And mm -hmm. I've also seen some, it's more rare, but they have like a really, really bright red um, coat. And here is just like a video of one of the boars. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess you can kind of just see like, they're really hairy. They're a lot more hairy than like the females. Um, the females are around 200 pounds and the males get to be around 300. So compared to other breeds, they can be like a little bit on the small side, I guess. Um, and they're smart. Um, they're pretty friendly despite being from a wild population that is not domesticated. Um, and here's like a better picture of what their tusks look yeah, like. Yeah, exactly. Um, and they know how to use them, by the way. I've got a scar in my leg from one of those things. Yeah, they can be um, aggressive. Um, so, this, why are they valuable animal models for research? They're an isolated population and they haven't changed a lot. Um, they haven't been introduced to any other breeds of pigs, um, which means that their genetic line is really pure. Um, and they're really similar, they're still really similar to the stock that was brought over by the explorers. Um, and since it's a natural population, it's good for longitudinal studies, so you can study them for a long period of time. Um, and they also have a tendency to develop pre-diabetes um, because of their environment um, and you have because you have a season of plenty and then a season of lack and that is the thing that causes the pre-diabetes. So just like a refresh, um, an overview of the two types of diabetes that you can have, uh, type 1, which is caused by genes. There might be some other factors, but people think that it's mainly just genetics and it's because the pancreatic cells cannot produce insulin, which means uh, the sugar in your blood cannot cross over into the cell, which means that your sugar stays in your blood, um, which results in hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. This is a lifelong disease and there is no cure. And then there's type 2, which is caused by your environment. Um, it's caused by infrequent large meals, um, which causes you to have insulin resistance. This is preventable, but once you have it, it can't be reversed and there's no cure for this one either. This is the type that Ocelot pigs have, and this is why, um, this is like the type of research that they're used in. And this is just a basic of how the diabetes type 2 happens. So when you have seasons of excess, when there's a lot of food, that means you're taking in a lot of sugar, and you need a lot of insulin to get the sugar across the cell membrane. Um, so if you do this a lot over time, frequently, where you have seasons where you're using a lot of insulin and then none, um, it creates these waves of insulin and your body slowly becomes more and more resistant to them, which also means that like your body doesn't have the same reaction to insulin as it once does, so the sugar doesn't cross over to the cell membrane as well as it used to, meaning it stays in the blood and results in hyperglycemia and diabetes type two. So yeah, and I'm ready for your questions. Okay. Questions? Rachel, did you say you were on that island helping with the research? Oh, no. Oh. They actually have um, a facility in Crawfordsville. It's pretty small, but, yeah. Down here in Crawfordsville? Mm -hmm. Okay, and what are they, are they doing diabetes or pre-diabetes? 
So. They're doing, they're raising them, and the people who are doing work on oh, okay. diabetes are buying them. They're selling, uh, they're, they're su supplier. Mm -hmm. um, how many pigs on the island? I'm not sure. Okay. It must be, you know, because if you just have a few, then that wouldn't be good because there'd be a lot of inbreeding, but it must be a, <coughs> enough diversity that they're, um, yeah. And by the way, those tusks, if a, it's like horns on a cow. If a cow has horns, she knows how to use them. The boar, if he's got tusks, he, he put his head against my leg and knew exactly to go up. Because that one that's pointing there, going down wouldn't hurt you. But his head, boom, up. And like, okay, through coveralls and jeans. I have a scar from, not that guy, but somebody similar.